Good morning, or maybe early afternoon by the time this is uh, processed and uploaded. We had good news this morning, very early this morning, about Carlos Hernandez, the 10-year-old I told you about yesterday. He's located safe, and so we can wish him well. Today we're going to talk about something uh, very serious, and it applies to almost everything that the true crime community gets involved in online. And let's not make any mistake about it. The behavior, the attitudes, the opinions, and so forth that happen online are real life. Let's get our disclaimers out of the way and then we can talk about it. This podcast is rated for a mature audience only. If you are under 18 years old, this content is not for you. Thank you for visiting us. There's plenty of other content on YouTube for you to watch. Have a great day. All content not created by the blue-haired bingo babe, that's me, belongs to its original creator. It is used to substantiate, augment, or exemplify this author's content. It is used under Title 17, Section 107 of U.S. Code, governing fair use for news, education, and critique. This is a screenshot from a channel called Betwixt, and on April 12th, she posted some thoughts about the drama triangle. And if you're on a phone, you won't be able to read this text, I don't think, so I'll read it for you. The drama triangle, a psychological model developed by the psychiatrist Stephen Cartman for an understanding of the unconscious power games that get played between people in conflict or codependent relationships. I'm sorry if I'm halting a little bit. It was difficult for me to read in my editor. Nevertheless, you get the gist or the setup for where we're going in this show. I don't know much about this channel. In fact, I really don't know anything about this channel, but this episode spoke to what I find myself caught up in or trying to get out of um, or stay away from often when I interact with people online, and that is this drama triangle. It's a power triangle, and any one of us can play any one of the three roles in this triangle at any given time. And that's what I like about what she has to say. And by the way, if I didn't mention her her channel name before, it is Betwixt the Story of You. And again, I know nothing other than this episode. So let's take a look at that drama triangle she's talking about. In this triangle model, we have the persecutor on the left, the rescuer on the right, and the victim on the bottom. And she points out that it doesn't matter whether you are the rescuer or the persecutor, doesn't matter where you start, you're going to end up eventually the victim. And I think that this applies to a variety of situations we've discussed in the last month in the Sebastian Rogers case alone. It also applies to the um, Monkey Vaughn case. I just posted on my community wall another channel who had commentary from Brandy Neal about what she's experienced as the parent of a missing child. And no question, it has been the dominant feature in the Summer Wells case. And it doesn't matter, you know, we have... Summer Wells as our protagonist firmly in the center of that case and everybody we talk about around Summer were asking the question how did they behave towards Summer. If you take any one of those people that we've been doing character archetypes on and stick them in the center instead of Summer then you can see how they've been 
sometimes a persecutor, sometimes a rescuer, and sometimes a victim of the circumstances they're in. I can give you a very easy, easy example. If you take an objective look at Jody Sue Brown's role throughout the Summer Wells case, from say a month before Summer Wells was reported missing all the way up to today, Jody Sue Brown cycles through these three roles on a pretty regular basis. She was the persecutor in terms of how nasty she talked about the neighbor's children and children in general, except for her own. Then she was the rescuer this very uh, next day. She was relating all the things, the scream, the searching, the sandals, the creek, the all the things, right? And, and then finally she was the victim when folks started saying, wait a minute, your story is not staying consistent. In fact, Shay's Safe Place pointed out yesterday in a little uh, well, three and a half minute video that Jody Sue went from saying that Jackie Dobbs, the man who bought property adjacent to her, the Bernard property, went from a trespasser to an harasser. And then Shay went on to point out that Jody Sue heard the scream in her cabin and then she heard it while she was walking the banks. But let's not get hung up on that. It's a simple example of what this triangle and so looks too, like. Some, but not all, of the true crime community. The crama subgenre of true crime is the example that we look at. We have channels on the one hand who go after other channels because they don't like what they say or do. And then the channel that they're going after, the subs and regular viewers and people who feel some affiliation with the channel holder become the rescuers. And then some of those people even uh, slide off into the flying monkey category that we talked about yesterday and go attack the channel that uh, initiated the conflict. And the victims end up being the audience in some real way because the audience is there um, for information and content and gets themselves tangled up in these conflicts and then from that the rescuers become the persecutors in the case of flying monkeys and this is something I have tried mightily to avoid because I've seen it cycle through over and over and over again. Let me give you another example. Let's go back to Monkey Vaughn's case. Initially, both parents were under scrutiny as is statistically borne out by the ratio of parent-involved parent abuse, neglect, or harm, or ultimate demise of missing persons. However, Brandy Neal was at work, and so she could not have been someone who had direct, um, what do I want to say, was not directly involved in Monkey Vaughn's disappearance. Some of the audience and some of the channel holders became her persecutors and really made things much more difficult for Brandy and her husband, as a matter of fact, um, because they took the approach that the parents must be guilty because parents statistically are guilty. But in Monkey Vaughn's case, that's not the case. And the people who played the persecutor role um, by going after Brandy and her husband made life exponentially harder and more heartbreaking um, 
with regard to Monkey Vaughn and his disappearance. The rescuers were the people who said, now wait a minute, you know, let's not jump to conclusions. We don't have all the facts. Law enforcement is looking at people completely outside of Brandy Neal's family and they might in fact be the perpetrators. But there are some people who still persist to this day to say that nope, it's Brandy or her husband or both. Making the parents victims. And my position is the culpability will come out in the wash. I will not persecute if I can help it, if I can keep my wits about me and not be swayed by public opinion, the parents. I will, if I have reservations about their actions, I will keep them to myself. And I will support them until charging documents are filed. Or, as in the case of Sebastian Rogers' three parents, I will do my mighty best to keep the focus on Sebastian Rogers, despite the fact that I have reservations about things that have been revealed and exposed about all three parents in the past. I will not persecute them, nor will I rescue them. I have defended Seth Rogers and I have admitted my bias. I like him. Uh, the part of him that he shows the public, the rational, um, forward thinking, tick every box off the list, man, I like that. And he is the gold standard when it comes to my kid is missing, I need to act. <clears throat> that comes, as I pointed out before, partly from gender. Uh, you know, Seth is a man, and he would rather be doing something than uh, feel like he can't do anything. Um, I have also not, I have shown my bias by not defending Chris Proudfoot or Katie Proudfoot in the same way. And the reason is because I don't see them out there doing. I would think as a man, Chris would be doing, but Chris is not doing. Let's be honest. He has a job. Allegedly, he's at that job. I don't have any way of confirming that. And I don't like it when people go after them and uh, photograph everything they're doing because it creates misunderstandings. This picture shows them at a bike shop. Therefore, they must be larking about buying a new bike instead of confronting the reality that their son slash stepson is missing. That might not be the case. It might be the case that Chris's idea of doing something is getting some splashy uh, big motorcycle gang to come on board as a show of support for finding Sebastian. I'm not going to criticize that. I'm not going to say that he's doing the wrong thing if that's what he's doing. And the last example of this drama triangle that I'm going to point out is that there are two creators who it has slowly come to light over the last, I don't know, maybe five or six weeks, but it's out there in public now. They are in a head-to-head -head conflict and I mod for one of them. You, I make no apologies and no, uh, no apologies for the fact that I mod for Duchess for the Missing. I have known Smiley Stories World and Duchess for three years now. We met in the same channel and we all seemed to be on the same page when it came to the Summer Wells case. Smiley's channel didn't really uh, get off the ground and get running until sometime last year. And I was a mod for Nana's Angels at the time. And my focus was on primarily my own channel and secondarily modding for Nana. So whenever Smiley started, 
you know, gaining momentum, I wasn't really that aware of it. But when I did become aware of it last summer or early fall, you know, I thought she did a good job. It was clear she didn't know how to use broadcast software and she was operating at somewhat of an advantage, but or disadvantage, but she was funny and she was humble at the time. And over time, her demeanor has changed. I don't know if she was masking and, you know, trying to gain some subs by being friendly and all that jazz. And then her real personality came out. Or if this is, you know, a byproduct of having a, an adult autistic son and being emotionally um, hooked into this case and not being able to step back and being objective. I don't know. What I do know is I don't like what I've seen of her behavior, not just in the case of Duchess, but in general. Her, her language has gotten very foul and she's angry all the time. That's not what I come to a channel for. I come to a channel for information and intelligent discussion. On the other hand, I'm not here to defend Duchy. She's a grown woman and she can defend herself. I am here mainly at, in her um, channel as a moderator. And when it fits my schedule and I'm not um, otherwise engaged in things of my own business, my own channel, you know, or asleep, because I go to bed pretty early and get up pretty early, so I have quiet, non-distracted time to be able to look after my own channel, that I mod for her. I owe Duchy a debt of personal gratitude, because when Nana passed and I needed a place of refuge and a place to be a little bit distracted from grief, Dutchie welcomed me with open arms. She uh, was very gracious and kind to me and patient and understanding. And so that is a personal interaction, but it does not extend to me rescuing or defending Dutchie or persecuting Smiley for less than becoming behavior. Dutchie's a grown woman. She can defend herself. She can make her own decisions about what she will do as uh, a defense of herself she doesn't need my help she hasn't asked for my help and i have stayed out of it because i don't want to be involved in the drama triangle even though we almost can't escape it because it's hardwired into us dutchy has my support on everything to do with missing persons and my help uh, as a moderator on her channel but she's never asked me or required of me to you know, fulfill these other roles. And so taking it out of the arena of two channels that I am familiar with at loggerheads right now, let's pull back to the 10,000 foot view and give the last example. For people who are talking about the chaos and mayhem on the quote, YouTube streets, close quote, you probably will never hear me use that phrase again. What they're failing to mention is this happens on a regular basis. And there are a couple reasons for it. The first reason is every time something new or shocking happens in specifically a vulnerable uh, person's case, a missing person's case, or, you know, a DV case, which we don't really hear about a lot uh, publicly because it's very risky. But everything, every time something dramatic happens, like Seth and Chris coming to this uneasy piece, that people continue to want to be some kind of massive conflict. What happens is there is a race to the bottom um, in the speculation uh, methodology. It starts out as, well, 
you know, this is unusual. This is weird. This doesn't track. I don't understand this. And goes right to the bottom with, you know. <sighs> gossip. Malicious. Snide. Comments. And, you know, that's where I disappear. I just, you just don't see me. Or if you do see me in comments, I'm making some rational point, maybe. Um, this happens every time, like I said, that there is a new development. The other reason it happens is because in the YouTube year, in the YouTube cycle of all the things, summertime is the worst viewing time for YouTube creators because all their subs, all their viewers, everybody's out doing other things. And so you will see a tendency to fall into this drama trap, track much higher in the summertime because of viewership. And that's a big mistake in my opinion and some professionals' opinions with regard to how you engage and keep your audience. If you want a quality audience who will engage with you in intelligent discussion and uh, your channel will have the reputation of being fact-based and a chill place to talk where nobody you know gets their head put on a pike for having an opinion then getting out of the drama triangle and cultivating a culture of uh, everybody is capable of getting their own needs met and nobody gets persecuted or rescued Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, y